Next up, we have Torterra. Appearing exactly as scheduled to round out the Sinnoh starters with no outside interference whatsoever. Nope. Right on time, just like how it always is. Anyway, Torterra was a fan favorite in the Generation 4 anime as a member of both Ash and his rival's team, which was pretty unique. However, it's been pretty low on appearances since then. And honestly, I don't really understand why, because honestly, I think the concept of a tortoise with its own ecosystem on its back is freaking cool. But anyway, today we'll find out if it had notable appearances on the competitive scene. So as always, we ask, how good was Torterra actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Unfortunately, Torterra is completely unusable in OU, and kinda always has been. It's strong, bulky, and has good coverage, but it's also slow and weak to common powerful attacks. It's a grass type that not only doesn't resist water, but also that every water type can one-hit KO with Ice Beam, or Ice Fang if your name is Gyarados. Grasses and grounds also tend to be strong against electric types, but when combined, Torterra's quadruple ice weakness meant the ubiquitous hidden power ice just dropped it. This meant it wasn't going to be pulling off a defensive set well at all, or at least not better than the other options in OU. Also, the popular attacks in the tier, which are a steady dose of Draco Meteors, close combats, U-turns, and of course Fire Blast, as well as the aforementioned ice moves, are often paired with the few moves Torterra actually did resist, like Stone Edge, Earthquake, and Thunderbolt, and honestly, this didn't help Torterra's cause. One might think it could fix its low speed with Rock Polish to then easily rip Pokemon apart with its powerful attacks, but it's so slow that common choice Scarfers like Infernate, Flygon, and Jirachi still outrun it, and it is also quite easily walled by common threats in the metagame, such as Breloom, Celebi, Shaman, Bronzong, and of course, Skarmory. It's not completely horrible, but it's also just not worth trying to make work, so Torterra can't really cut it in overuse. But in underuse, however, it blossomed. The lower overall power level meant it fit in right at home, both in being able to tank hits better and in being able to dish out more damage. With defensive Pokemon such as Registeel, Donphan, Rhyperior, Claydol, and Celix being prominent, Torterra could easily switch into them and set up Stealth Rock. With the more intuitively physically defensive spread, Torterra was seriously tough to break through on that spectrum. Even impressive attacks like Dragon Dance for Alligator without Life Orb failed to KO it with Ice Punch, and Life Orb Rhyperior's Megahorn came nowhere near KO range. Torterra was even able to shrug off the mighty Swords Dance Absol. Also, Dragon Dance Altaria was of course laughable. However, late in the generation, Torterra was discovered to be incredibly useful with its special defense beefed up to the max which let it pull some tricks its counterpart, King of Underused, and biggest competition, Venusaur, couldn't even dream of. With Torterra's brutally powerful wood hammer, it would slice through Nasty Plot Miss Magius while not fearing Shadow Ball, whereas Venusaur didn't possess the same one-hit KO threat. Even a Life Orb Power Whip wouldn't KO. Not to mention that having a set like that would mean Venusaur wasn't packing the bulk to take powerful Shadow Balls. Substitute plus Charge Beam Rotom got the same treatment, except it was even more incapable of inflicting any meaningful damage. Torterra could also take a Life Orb Psychic and Signal Beam combination from Alakazam with Stealth Rock up, to which Venusaur is of course terrified by the prospect of facing Alakazam. And lastly, being able to take one Ice Beam from Milotic could save a game. And while yes, it would always be two hit KO'd, Torterra actually only took 55-65% to 65 from the defensive variants. But of course, Venusaur's Poison Typing comes with the enormous benefit of absorbing Toxic Spikes upon entry, as opposed to Torterra's weakness to them. However, with the dearth of excellent grounded Poison and types and underuse such as Toxicroak, Drapion, and Nidoking, this usually wasn't a problem. Now, Torterra wasn't entirely relegated to defensive duties, however. It could also be a formidable offensive threat. After a rock polish, the flying types such as Moltres and Scyther that gave Torterra stabs grief were no more than victims of a powerful Stone Edge. While most other offensive members found themselves in severe danger of being maimed by said stabs, especially with how common the fire, water, grass core was, and with the grass type usually being Venusaur, Torterra's stabs would go to town. It was a huge threat against familiar teams. Now, having said that, it wasn't flawless. It sorely desired Adamant's power for the extra muscle against Venusaur and Clefable. But without Jolly, it'd be revenge killed by Scarf Rotom, Mespirit, Blaziken, and Milotic. And even Jolly wouldn't save it against Scarf Primate. It also had a few hard walls. Weezing and Tangrowth were its biggest nightmare, but at least they were usually on more balanced teams that you'd expect to not do too much with a Rock Polisher. Instead, just trying to take out plain damage and take some hits would be enough. 
However, an offensive team with Leafy on would be awful because you'd count on Torterra to slice through those teams, only for them to have a natural hard counter that posed a massive threat in return. Finally, Life Orb and Woodhammer recoil was nothing to sneeze at, and Torterra could often find itself in priority range quite quickly, be it Extreme Speed from Arcanine, Vacuum Wave from Blaziken, Aqua Jet from Azumaro, or Sucker Punch from Absol, it wasn't uncommon for its sweep to be cut short by these. Despite these drawbacks though, Offensive Torterra proved time and time again it was a menace on the other side of the spectrum as well. And to wrap things up, we'll illustrate how relevant Torterra was with the fact that it was regularly involved in notorious speed creep wars alongside undeniable underused staples such as Milotic, Rhyperior, Clefable, and Azumarill. And usually you don't bother EVing your Pokemon for something that doesn't have a firm place in the metagame. This speaks to how Torterra needed to be kept in mind for a successful team. It was one of the Pokemon key in making Diamond and Pearl under you such a colorful tier with an abundance of diverse strategies. Now on to black and white. Torterra definitely had no place in the brutally power crept overuse metagame, and with 5th generation's underuse coming to resemble the previous generation's overuse, it didn't pop up there either. It wound up as quite the decent Pokemon in rarely use, and with the old specially defensive set, it was a terrific vault switching blocking check to Magneton, Rotom, and Rotom Cut that set up Stealth Rock and wasn't afraid to go toe to toe with Kabutops, although it didn't relish the idea of facing rarely use's other premier spinner, Cryogonal. The Snowflake his pitiful defense meant it didn't want to eat Torterra's Woodhammer, meaning that Torterra was solid at laying up Stealth Rock for its team, especially because it wasn't threatened by an early metagame standoff with the scariest Pokemon in rarely used. Drudagon. It also made for some excellent bulky hazard cores, alongside the new Intimidate Quillfish. Unfortunately, the prominence of Tangrowth and its brand new Regenerator meant that Torterra's offensive days were over, but its defensive niche was irreplicable and thus gave it a niche in the rarely used metagame. But Torterra actually ended up in never used though, and there it strangely was almost never seen, and definitely seen less than in rarely used. And it's tough to say why, since its stats would suggest a solid place in the metagame. This can probably be attributed to the reign of Jinx and Skull until their ban at the very end of the tier's life, Charizard's ceaseless dominance, the power of other flyers like Rotom Fan and Braviary, and the fact that Grass-type competition was tough, since Eviolite Regenerator Tangela helped against the incredibly dangerous Samurai. Torterra wasn't going to be doing any sweeping with it around either, so forget the offensive option, and it just didn't have many good defensive targets. If Black and White Never Use had continued to be a tier in the limelight, it's not unlikely we'd have seen a more definable niche for Torterra come to the limelight, especially with Bullet Seed, which would let it match up against sturdy Caracosta and Golem, but such is life. Now on to X and Y. Finding itself in the lowermost rungs of the tiering ladder once again in the 6th generation, Torterra had quite a niche shift in rarely use. Its now valued trait was breaking through the ridiculously resilient Registeel Alomomola, or the Regimola core, with a specially defensive Swords Dance synthesis set that turned it into a hulking threat that would tear a lot of balanced teams apart if Golbat could be dealt with properly, which is not unreasonable or difficult, since it was relied on to the Fog Away Stealth Rock, so you could plan for it pretty easily. It was wasn't the most uncommon Pokemon, but it was a solid chance for targeting one of the most difficult to break popular cores in the metagame. Having a good switch for Choice Specs Magneton never hurts either. In never use, Torterra wasn't that common, since as a Stealth Rock setter, it failed to do anything meaningful to Zatu, and was weak to a plethora of common attacks, such as stabs from Jinx and Pyroar. That said, its powerful stab combination does threaten bulkier tier staples such as Rhydon and Garbodor, but it's difficult to make it work when it's so easily countered by other staples like Weezing and Gorgai Small and extra large. Ice Shard from the common pile of swine didn't help matters either. Torterra wasn't a bad pick, but it had tough matchups against a lot of good Pokemon in the metagame, and thus required a deft hand to get the most use out of it. In VGC, Torterra was quite rare, which is expected, but it surprised people with a few appearances in Gen 6 VGC. Alvin Moe used a relaxed variant that survived Life Orb Talonflame's Brave Bird, holding a Yatchberry for the super common ice attacks and Wide Guard for the ever-present spread moves of Earthquake, Icy Wind, Heat Wave, Hyper Voice, and Rock Slide, making one beastly team supporting tank that enabled threats like Mega Salamence. Alvin used this to reach 28th at the SoCal Regionals in 2015. Jake Rosen also used a Wide Guard Torterra to reach top 8 of Massachusetts regionals in the senior division. So yeah, Torterra predictably is not exactly a top threat, or anything close to it, but it's nice that it had somewhat of a niche. And perhaps if the metagame had lasted a little longer, maybe it would have been explored more, but there's a plethora of grass types and ground types to use over it, so it's not surprising that it only has these two appearances. Or at least these are the notable ones we found. 
Now finally, Sun and Moon. While the Z-Move power creep meant Torterra no longer had a place and rarely used, it also meant that it had a new lease on life and never used, taking it from a barely existing state of limbo and injecting it with a variety of viable options. While its defensive stealth rocking variants were solid with the prominence of Diancy, Slowbro, Steelix, Rhydon, Passimian, Heliolisk, and Whimsicott, the offensive options opened up to it with Bloom Doom and Continental Crush, which gave it the spark it needed, both on stealth rocking sets, which could lure and remove Golbat easily now, and sweeping sets, which loved the extra boost to push past something that otherwise just barely hung on and cut his sweeps short, such as Guzzlord. Torterra being a grass type with a vicious stab earthquake for metagame definer Incineroar was also quite an effective offensive niche. It was a wonderfully varied threat that provided all kinds of great utility to a wide variety of teams, and who knows, with about 9 months left of Sun and Moon, maybe we'll see something else, like Tectonic Rage for Vileplume. And that's it, so how good was Torterra actually? Well, it was never overused material. But its unique typing went well with its well-rounded stats to give it a decent to solid niche in the lower tiers. It even managed to snag a few respectable placements in VGC for at least one year. Overall, Torterra wasn't fantastic, but it was good enough where it ended up. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False White Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And as for the comments, I want to know, what do you think about competitive Torterra? Terra. How would you make it better? Do you think the grass starters in general just need to be better or do you think that people just like fire and water better? I don't know. Whatever it is, let me know in the comments below. And of course, to vote for next week's Pokemon, be sure to comment on the post on the community tab of this channel, which will likely go up around the same time as this video is released. And as always, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.